this panel brings together innovative thinkers, innovative practitioners who have to talk about innovative strategies for supporting job training and job creation in communities hardest hit by unemployment and to share strategies for accessing career ladders that increase family income and stability, recognizing that communities are situated within regional economies and therefore you can't perhaps think about focus neighborhood change in exactly the same ways as that you might for other kinds of outcomes. And so that recognition of how the place fits in the region is going to be quite apparent in this panel. So let me go ahead and introduce our panelists um, in somewhat alphabetical order, leaving Manuel Pastor for last as he as our moderator and framer of the session. So Jay, Jay Banfield we're pleased to have as managing director of California and Chief uh, Officer of Scale and Innovation for Year Up, which is a nationally recognized nonprofit organization. What Year Up does is it works with young adults living in urban settings to reach their full potential through paid training and corporate internships at over 380 partners nationwide, and they've particularly focused on the information companies like the LinkedIn's and Twitter's and Ebay's and Google's, Yelp's, Mozilla, etc. Um, prior to the, his current role, Jay founded Europe in the Bay Area and served as executive director for eight years. I'd like to also welcome Denise Fairchild to the panel. And, and while Denise Fairchild is currently president of Emerald, the Emerald Cities Collaborative, which is a nonprofit coalition of labor, business, community-based organizations working together to advance a sustainable environment, uh, Denise is also well known in Los Angeles. Uh, because of her work uh, as the Chair of Community and Economic Development at LA Trade Tech, which is right around the corner here. While at LA Trade Tech, she helped launch the Regional Economic Development Institute, which was an initiative to provide inner city residents with career and technical education for high growth and high demand jobs in Los Angeles. And Dr. Fairchild received her doctorate in urban planning right across town at UCLA. Uh, Michael Peck is a third panelist I'd like to introduce. He's co-founder of the organization One, Ver One Worker, One Vote, which is a national network of unionized worker-owned cooperative businesses. One Worker, One Vote seeks to overcome income inequality by bringing together the solidarity of unions, the business skills of cooperative owners, and the strength of a national like-minded network to create jobs, share investment opportunities, and cross-chain worker owners. And since 1999, Michael has also served as the North American delegate of the Mondragon Corporation, which is a federation of 260 worker cooperatives dedicated to maintaining a democ democratic organizational structure that prioritizes labor above capital. And as of last year, Mondragon had a more than 74,000 employees and sales of about 12 billion euros. And finally, I'm pleased to introduce and welcome my friend and colleague, uh, Manuel Pastor, to the panel. He's a professor of sociology, American studies, and probably a few other uh, departments uh, here at USC. Manuel currently directs the Program for Environmental and Regional Equity at USC and also USC's Center for the Study of Immigrant Integration. His research is focused on the economic, environmental, and social conditions facing low-income communities. In his most recent book, Equity, Growth, and Community, What it, the Nation Can Learn from America's Metro Areas, argues how inequality stunts economic growth and how equity actually uh, facilitates that growth. Um, he is, we're excited, he, he now holds the inaugural, uh, he's the inaugural holder of the Turpa Jian, I'm sorry I said that wrong, please correct me, uh, uh, on that, uh, Chair in Civil Society and Social Change at USC. I mean, if you want to work for equity, you need to fight for justice. Uh, that we really need, when we think about policy, to think about the theory of change and constituencies and movements and organizations that will make sure that those uh, policies get realized. So when we think about uh, workforce issues, um, can you move the slide forward if this isn't working? Um, it's important to realize uh, a couple of different things. One striking thing about workforce development policy is that we've increasingly moved to integrating it with the private sector. What's kind of contradictory about that is that when workforce development really started in the 1960s, it was about using the public sector uh, to be able to give people a platform into the economy. 
fascinatingly, we were using the public sector at a time in which the private sector was actually working and functioning for most people. As soon as the private sector stopped actually delivering high quality employment, we shifted workforce development away from the public sector to the faltering private sector. Is it any wonder that we continue to have problems? Second thing that I think is really important to note about big shifts in workforce development policy is that it's often about reaching communities of concentrated poverty. But the nature of concentrated poverty has changed. Previously, when we thought about concentrated poverty, the William Julius Wilson, when work disappears, joblessness aspect was probably the right sort of description. Now, you might think that the real description is when wages erode. Because in many communities of concentrated poverty, people are actually deeply attached to the labor market. They're working, but they're working at low quality employment. And the third sort of big trend that I think is really sets the stage for thinking about workforce development is the fact that we've had incredibly slow job growth coming out of this uh, recession. This is the second worst job performance since uh, 1945 in terms of recovery from a recession. And we had a disappearance of the middle, which caused a lot of people to retreat from that sector of the labor market. As you'll be talking about a little bit later, that middle sort of re coming because the workforce is aging out and there are actually new opportunities. So we need to think about workforce a little bit differently. And when we think about workforce a little bit differently, workforce developers now need to do three tasks instead of just one. When we thought about workforce development in the past, it was mostly about meeting markets. That is, preparing people in terms of human capital and connecting people on the demand side and supply side so that they could find each other in markets that might have been imperfect, that might have included transit connections, etc. But increasingly, we also need to mold and make markets. Molding means changing the conditions of employment. So the struggles to increase the minimum wage, to actually get paid family leave, uh, and the sorts of things uh, that actually improve, improve employer con uh, employment conditions are important. The making markets is understanding that it's no longer fitting into an economy that's functioning, and it's a question of connecting to it. It's a question, really, of using levers to create an alternative cooperative economy, or uh, in Denise's case, using the emergence of the green economy uh, to leverage your way into employment for low-income individuals. Now, in doing this uh, meeting, uh, molding and making, uh, a couple of things matter. First thing is sectors matter. One of the things that's really emerged if you're trying to make a market is to figure out what are the sectors that are growing, either on their own, because that's what's happening in the economy, or, be, or because you can use uh, lever public policy to help grow that sector. That's a lot of what Denise will talk about, I hope, uh, and expect. But you can see it also in the initiatives that's been called Jobs to Move America, trying to take advantage of the fact that Los Angeles, for example, is going to be spending so much money on rail, but we haven't s insisted on making sure that that rail car assembly occurs in a way that actually generates local employment. So sectors matter. Quality matters. And that means job quality. One really interesting initiative kind of profile in the paper is the profile of the Restaurant Opportunities uh, Center, which aside from creating its own restaurant colors, has actually tried to also create a high road employers association to help firms to promote high quality jobs, has tried to address racism in the restaurant industry that makes the uh, uh, wait people disproportionately white and the people waiting in the back disproportionately people of color, uh, and really address that in terms of changing the quality of available employment. We are going to have what are called low skill, although they require lots of skill, service jobs in the future. How do we improve the quality of that employment? Institutions matter, and two kinds of institutions are incredibly important. One is the community college system, which is a tremendous platform for connecting people uh, to the labor market, particularly people uh, of middle skills. Uh, this is where CD Tech was located, trying to articulate with the Los Angeles Community College District. Uh, the other kind of institution that matters are anchor institutions and making sure that they generate local employment. Huge opportunities that should be taken advantage of with this anchor institution and its investments in the University Village in terms of what employment can be generated from that, what small businesses can be spun from it, and what gentrification can be resisted as a result of actually investing in affordable housing. So institutions matter. 
connections matter because it's not, and here I want to uh, say that it's not simply creating these opportunities, but figuring out why it is that people don't wind up connecting. And I want to look at just three. One is the barriers to reentry for those who've been recently incarcerated, the whole ban the box movement, uh, but also much more in terms of training and reconnecting. We've got a huge and significant issue, particularly with African American males, of coming out of a criminal justice system and not being able to connect to the labor market. We've got issues for immigration, and we certainly have issues for single uh, uh, female headed households, where there's lots of routes, particularly in construction, to better quality jobs. And the one thing here I really want to leave you with is that when we think about those disconnections, the word people often use is disadvantaged. You've heard that, right? Uh, instead of intentionally fucked over, right, which might be a better description of what's happened with our system of over-incarceration, tenuous immigration status, and the way in which we've marginalized single uh, female-headed households and not delivered the support they need to be able to complete their education, get through community college, et cetera, we have to understand that this has not been an accident of disadvantage. It's been built into policy, which is that relationships matter. And here, developing relationships with employers, uh, developing relationship with partners to overcome structural barriers, et cetera. And this is uh, that if, we, if you look at many of the best efforts in any of these areas, what you're going to find is that they are uh, good at delivering new practices and programs and services, but they're generally very deeply connected to advocacy. That is, the anchor institutions don't deliver unless there's a mobilized community forcing them to deliver. We're going to be able to take advantage of the green economy because of the kind of work that the Emerald Cities Collaborative is doing. Jobs to Move America was not thought up by the rail car manufacturers, but it was thought up by folks associated with the Los Angeles Alliance for a New Economy. So if you really want to work for equity, you need to fight for justice and support the organizations to do that. If your theory of change is about coming up with a better policy and recommending it to someone, then you're likely to be sitting in rooms recommending policy to other people recommending policy to themselves. The idea of engaging and linking up to constituencies that can actually move change and articulating the policies in relationship with them is absolutely crucial. If you really want to learn a lot about this, this new book, Equity, Growth, and Community, uh, is you know tremendous at just kind of really laying out these issues. Uh, and aside from being available on Amazon.com, it literally is free as a download from UC Press at a website called Growing Together metro.org, growing together metro.org. We're a national organization, we're a nonprofit, we're we are working in coalitions of labor, business, and community. We're in 10 metropolitan regions around the United States. And I guess the short um, description of what we are doing is, is actually promoting economic inclusion in uh, the, a growth sector, and it is the, the green economy. Uh, and so I guess people look at us as about promoting green jobs, but it is a lot more complicated than that. So let me give you the sort of the short script of what we're doing. So the whole idea is there's at least $3 trillion of infrastructure and green building investments that are long overdue um, in the United States. We are at the place where we have to uh, rebuild, re-engineer, our communities to be uh, greener, to be healthier, and to be more resilient. That's an opportunity that is uh, quite large. And, and our job at Emerald Cities is to do three things in that respect. One is uh, job creation, all right, so increase the quantity of jobs that are available, job quality, and improve the quality of jobs that are available in this green economy, and thirdly, uh, then job access. Uh, and we are doing this specifically for low-income communities of color to make sure that these communities that have historically been on the periphery of the mainstream economy are now front and center and owning and driving that process. Uh, now, the, the, the way that we do that is it is a sector approach. Uh, we look at, not limited to, but look at specifically the clean energy sector as a way to begin to figure out how we uh, position folks in, into these opportunities. Um, the, the, the fact of the matter is that the sector strategy is, um, looks at the demand and the supply side of this sector. On the one hand, the job creation part of it is, all right, everybody understands what climate change is all about, that, that we have to get out of fossil fuels, that we're moving into renewables, 
that energy efficiency is the way of the future. As, as much as we get that, it is extremely difficult for municipalities or university schools and hospitals to figure out how to pay for that. All right? uh, even though you can sell them on you know, the, the cost containment and how this is going to improve their operating budget of their, of their facility, it is still hard to figure out how to get it paid. So part of what we have to do is actually create the financing platforms to make it easier for people then to actually retrofit their buildings or to put on solar or to otherwise uh, con conserve energy and or water. So as a workforce development entity, we've got to figure out how you finance the creation of jobs as, as the very first beginning of this. So there's a policy push, there's a policy play um, that's very critical to this, and that's why it's more than just a labor force attachment, is how do you create the policies that begin to drive the demand. We then have to actually work with the building owners and aggregate their, their properties, help them navigate you know, all of the, the different uh, stakeholders that are involved in actually doing the building retrofit. So the demand side of this is the very beginning point of actually creating jobs for people. But the other part is making sure that these jobs are good quality jobs. 57% of the work in the energy sector are construction jobs. And a lot of that is really about um, these, this low road economy. You know, these are off book sometimes, they're, they're seasonal, uh, they're, they're safety challenges and issues. So the most important part of making sure that these jobs are gonna pay and pay well is to see if we can make them uh, union jobs. Because this is the place where you get the benefits, you get decent wages, you get uh, career training uh, opportunities, and the, the, the challenge is that um, PLAs, project labor agreements, and union jobs are hard to come by. These are hard fought jobs. And then when we get PLAs, uh, getting community workforce agreements attached to them where it says that a certain percentage of, of those jobs are set aside for communities of color is the next barrier that we have to overcome. These are, this is a sector that has been um, discriminatory, racist, and exclusionary for over 100 years and changing the culture of unions is part of the work that has to be done to make sure that the jobs are high quality jobs and that they are also available for communities of color. Um, and then making sure that that access happens is then working on the supply side of that sector. And that means two things for us. What we do is, number one, make certain that uh, the workforce infrastructure operates well, that the community colleges are working with community-based training um, organizations that are working with apprenticeship programs, that are working with the workforce investment board, boards. Let's just blow out our brains on that one, right? Um, but we've got to make sure that the supply line works and it's seamless and people have easy access to these opportunities. And then the other part that we work on, and, and Veronica Soto, our LA director, is here, is to make sure minority women uh, own small um, uh, veteran contractors get a, a part to play in this as well. Um, when it came to LA County, we have a major workforce contract with LA County. They have like 80 solar projects that they're about to put on the street. They had one one minority contractor that was on their master agreement that was eligible to do work for the county. It's, uh, we have been making, we have pre-qualified at least six now, it's about six or seven contractors, and the very first contractor that came out of our e-contractor academy really just launched February 20th, the first zero net energy building in the entire LA County. So we've got a lot of work to do to make sure that we're creating the jobs, that they're going to be high quality jobs, and at the end of the day, that our communities have access to these opportunities. While we're activating the market, fundamentally, our work is to transform the market because it's not just about plugging into these jobs that exist. The energy sector, um, we've got to dismantle this economy because we have an intersectional uh, framework uh, for how we understand that not only is about the economic opportunities, but how that energy sector is undermining our health and our, uh, the social equity in terms of, uh, of health and, and, and climate change, how it's impacting our environment, um, and then what is it doing in terms of the concentration of wealth and income inequality. So at the end of the day, we are really pushing for a new type of energy economy, which is community owned, community controlled, we're decarbonizing the economy, we decommodifying it, and we detoxing ourselves from being off of this 
materialism and this consumerism, which is making us uh, totally out of balance with our ecosystem. Uh, boy, let's give a big round of applause. I'm going to ask the question I was going to ask later, but I want to say one thing on the way to uh, Jay, which is that I've known you now for quite some time. Mm. And I've got to say, she's been saying this for a very long time before folks were thinking about the restorative economy, about how to move forward and how to really bring the environment and equity and economic growth together. Uh, Jay, I'm absolutely fascinated by the work that you're doing. I'm sure that others will as well. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit about it uh, and actually also some of the myths people have about the disappearing middle versus the jobs that are being created there and where employers are really demanding new workers. Pleased to be here and happy to talk a little bit about our, our program and really as an avenue into a broader discussion about justice, which is really why I'm happy to be on this panel. Uh, in Europe, we try to focus in on moving young adults from poverty to professional careers within one year's time. And we really look at that through the lens, as Manuel uh, alluded to, the lens of middle skill jobs. So if I think about the focus of our work, is that there is projected to be a deficit of 12 million middle skill laborers over the, by, by the time of 2020. And the question Michael asked at the beginning is, what is your number? Well, the number that drives me is the 5.5 million opportunity youth who are in our country. Looking at the 18 to 24 year olds who are systemically disconnected from the economic mainstream, by virtue of where they were born, the color of their skin, the amount of money that their parents do or don't have. At Year Up, what we try to do is we bring together those talented young people with the opportunities that exist within the labor market, and probably not surprisingly in a year-long program focusing on marketable, hard marketable IT skills. We focus in on those technology roles. We then layer that on top of those technology skills, those business communication skills, the soft skills that are required for success within the labor market. Those young people then move into an internship for six months, and then they move into, um, into jobs, in which we measure, and we'll talk a little bit about that. I was thinking about the, and looking at the framing paper before coming here, and, and trying to use some of the language that uh, Manuel has offered for us. A lot of what we do is there are millions of jobs that are open right now as we sit here today that are in those middle skill categories, those jobs that require less than a four-year degree but more than a high school diploma. They require some specialized training. And there are millions of those jobs that are sitting vacant right now. A lot of the, the work that we do is we try to mold the market. And what I mean by that is that if I think about those 5.5 opportunity youth within our country, they have, like all of us in this room, have faced challenges that have built up a resilience, a grit, and a determination that make for an incredible employee if they recognize the competitive advantage it offers them in the marketplace and if companies recognize and properly value those skills. If we talk to employers, the things that they're looking for are those things that are about grit, determination, moving past obstacles. But companies have a hard time measuring it and naming it, and we help to form and mold that market for the companies. And then in terms of making a market, is that I think that there are, there's this idea that we fall back to the four-year degree as a proxy, which makes a lot of sense. I have a four-year degree. I think it served me well in lots of different venues. But I also argue that there are many jobs that don't require that four-year degree. That proxy is, is very inaccurate. And we, ex we exclude millions of Americans just by virtue of implying that. And so we spend a lot of time talking to our corporate partners about what are the jobs that you have? Do they really require a four-year degree? Is there a specialized training that can make someone successful in those roles? And I think the good news and the happy news is that we've been successful in partnering with more than 380 companies throughout the country. We're in 13 cities. We'll be coming to LA later this year, which we're excited about. Uh, really looking three verticals in healthcare, technology companies, and financial services companies. And what we've seen since our inception is we've served more than 14,000 young adults, opportunity youth. And if I look at our most recent example in our most recent graduating class in the Bay Area, they moved on average coming into the program at $5,000 a year, and they graduated earning $23.25 an hour. So moving from $5,000, $6,000 a year to forty dollars to forty, $4,000 a year in income. So I'm looking forward to the conversation, but wanted to provide that frame of our work, but I think hopefully how it points to the broader discussion that exists. 
thank you all for staying to hear the last and the least. <laughs> um, who here has heard of Mondragon? Please raise your hand. Okay, so I'll give you the, the classic illustrated comic book version and, and not the full story. I want to tell, talk briefly in my very brief minutes. Um, I want to condense 45 minutes to five minutes. And I'm going to do this by two parables because um, kicking the tires, I think at the end of a long day is um, a close encounter with reality. And I think we need to have a reality check right now. We're living in the most unequal country in the OECD roster. Um, we have a lower social mobility quotient than Zimbabwe. Um, the statistics are so bad that um, everything that we were brought up to understand about this country has been turned on its head. And the reason that we're missing all of this uh, transformation after spending tens and hundreds of millions of dollars is because we've forgotten the basic precept of what brought those of us who did not come here as property, which is a completely different path. Those of us who did not came here to own something. And if you read the book Citizen Share uh, by Mr. Dr. Cruz, um, Freeman, and Blasey, they talk about uh, even in our colonial times, the U.S. constitutional uh, setup that was evolving knew how to protect uh, people in agriculture and people in fishing, were the two biggest industries of the time, in terms of tariffs and developing ownership. Ownership has been the only tide that has risen, and it's the only boat that everybody ever had until recently. Now we're living in America where we have the highest the highest example of absentee uh, landlord or ownership since before the Gilded Age, before the Great Depression. And that has produced the stagnant, stubborn uh, inequality that our, our country faces. And it's become a corporatist tax that uh, all of us are unable uh, fiscally to pay because it's too expensive. So uh, Mondragon is not a model. Uh, we think that would be presumptuous. Um, arrogant, not humble, as we talked about in another panel. It's a 60-year experience. And it's experience coming from the combined destruction of the Spanish Civil War and also World War II. So if you've seen the picture of Picasso's painting of Guernica, it's a good symbol of what Mondragon looked like, except it was worse. It was in the middle of the Basque region, the mountainous region, 60% unemployment, cholera, famine, you name it. They had it, and um, a little village priest showed up. He was the substitute priest. The one they sent showed up and chickened out, and he came in his bicycle. And for 15 years, he preached collaboration, and they finally started a little uh, cooperative, and then they started another one and another one, and because they couldn't find banks to lend, they created their own bank, and because they couldn't find uh, mutual to provide social security, they created their own mutual, and the school became a university. Fast forward 60 years, it's about, you know, a $16 billion company, um, if, you know, depending on the exchange rate. We have our own bank, one of the most profitable banks in Spain that last year won the award for the number one in customer service. We have our own insurance mutual, one of the most solid in Europe. Uh, and we have a university with 6,000 students that wins all sorts of awards. We have 12 technology centers, 900 patents. We won the 2013 Fortune Magazine Boldness in Business Award. Fortune says we're always one of the 10 places in the world where everybody wants to work. And we're studied by just about every graduate school in the United States. We spend zero on PR because we have the highest earned media ratio of anybody, but we spend a ton of money internally on making sure we understand our roots and where we've come from. And so the big question is, how do you translate something like that to the United States? And the answer is you don't. Um, the answer is you can eclectically take certain things and adopt. And so in 2009, uh, there were some of us, uh, President Obama was calling the first job summit in the White House that December, this is late October, and um, some of us had, were either going to that or staffing people that were going or had written a paper or something, and we realized that there wasn't new thinking happening at that particular meeting, no fault of the president, but there wasn't going to be the new thinking that we required uh, for this country after the devastation of 2008. In 2008, in my office in DC, we were receiving maybe 20 to 30 uh, calls a week asking, could you please, 
have a Mondragon in my town? Could you please have a Mondragon in my barrio in Buffalo? So Leo Girard, who's international president of the Steelworkers, um, if those of you haven't met Leo, I advise you to do it. Um, he's one of the most gifted visionary labor leaders in our continent, um, who's never forgotten where he came from. He crawled out of a mine in Sudbury, Canada. Um, he and uh, people from Mondragon got together and said, you know, in the 1840s in Rochdale, England, unions and cooperatives were created together. The famous Rochdale partners were really the impetus of both the union and the cooperative movements. And over time, they've diversified, they've been in parallel universes, they haven't connected. But now in America, given our inequality epidemic, it's time we put them together. So we created an MOU. It was a historic moment for the steelworkers, America's, uh, North America's largest manufacturing union. And it was a historic moment for Mondragon because we don't have any unions in Mondragon. We didn't do this in Spain. And here we are doing this in the United States. So this was a question of everybody leaping beyond their comfort level and doing something different. We then got bombarded with even more calls uh, from everybody who thought that we were bringing the answer to everybody on everything, including the bank. And of course, that was not true either. And that was a very humbling moment. So we formed a, a committee of 50 wise people, wiser than us. It was very easy to find. Uh, we went around the country, did a listening tour. The ratio of two ears to one mouth worked well. We copied things down diligently, and in 2012 in Pittsburgh, in the atrium of the Steelworkers Union, uh, their international headquarters, we announced our union co-op template, we, uh, th and then the world exploded. We're now uh, in 16 cities in the United States. We have helped to create a union taxi company in Denver. Uh, matter of fact, because of our efforts and the team that actually did it in Denver, uh, worker-owner taxi drivers are the majority uh, form of taxi transportation. It is the number one um, sharing economy push against Uber, Uber to make sure that workers are not involuntarily shared. We've been asked by the Vatican to write an encyclical on worker ownership. Harvard Business School has just done a case study on us. We have created uh, union co-ops all around the country. We have 30 unions working with us. And we realize in America that if you don't go to the weakest links of the chain, the chain will never stand. It'll never serve its pur purpose. And um, you'll be missing um, what's really happening in America because uh, you will be spending your time talking to yourselves instead of addressing the problem. So what I learned from today, and I'm going to sit down, is that there are a lot of really good solutions going on. But the answer is in the streets. The answer is with the people who have the least. The answer is underserved communities of color, the people who don't are not part of the ownership quadrant in America. And unless we come up with policies and projects that result in jobs and tires, economic development tires that we can kick, we are just talking to ourselves and we are not doing our job. So uh, a tremendous economic success and asked by the Vatican to write an encyclical. Uh, you, my friend, are a slacker. Uh, so <laughs> I wanted to- well, It takes a village. Yes. Uh, I wanted to uh, start with uh, Denise and uh, Jay, uh, with a question. When we talk about moving workforce development forward, we're often focusing in on uh, these workers, what the sectors are, uh, a number of other things. How do you get business on board? What's the secret to getting business and investors engaged in these activities? Clearly, Michael's also often a, an alternative uh, to doing that, having workers themselves be the investors, but in the worlds in which you work, in which getting business involved is critical, uh, what's the path that you use, Denise? And certainly, I know that's something you're working on. Well, I think there are a couple of strategies. One is uh, to be in the mind's eye of the sector that you're looking into. You've got to be as uh, proficient about what it is that they care about, what drives them, who are their players, what, you know, where their pain is, to be able to um, represent yourself as someone who is actually can be a value added to, to their work. And to, to just say that we can provide you with assets and resources to help your, your company grow. In some instances, uh, because if in this instance where you are trying to push them out of one product into another, it's from fossil fuels into renewables, then 
it really takes the community and it takes organizing to get policies pushed, whether it's the, you know, the nature of the clean power plan or other kinds of policies that uh, uh, net metering and other things that we're using as tools to push the regulatory end of this. Um, Jay, you have to work directly with making businesses actually recognize the talent that they are letting go to waste. Tell us a little bit about how you get business engaged. You know, it makes me think of the, of the prior panel and the question from the student from Oregon is, um, we sit down with our partners and we really try to understand what their needs are. So I think it's, part of it is the dialogue. You have to have that communication and that there has to, if I look at the bigger problem that exists is that there's a signaling problem that exists in the market. There's a fundamental breakdown in our labor market where the, um, I think private sector is not sending the signals in the, the time nor in the strength of signal that they believe they are. And I think there's an obligation from education and from uh, nonprofits to respond to that. But the first thing is to have that conversation. And without fail, when I sit down and talk to you know, the right person in the, in the company, whether it's a CIO or the CTO, everyone says they have a problem with the skills gap. They have a hard time finding people, they have a hard time developing people, they have a hard time retaining people. And then we say to them, well look, we have a source of talent that maybe is not as available to you as it should be, and maybe not as visible to you as it should be. Um, let us solve that business problem for you, and then let's talk about growing the relationship. Uh, and that, I think, is the starting point, is really understanding what that mutual benefit is. And the trick is, how do you create that, that table so there's an ongoing dialogue, so that you're really understanding what the needs are real time, what they look like to be in six months' time. And then as technology moves, it's a little bit harder to go further than that. Um, so but trying to figure out how to rephrase this question, but, but for Michael, because what you're trying to do is create an alternative within the markets as well, but you're also existing in an economy where there's lots of bus private businesses, business investment. How do you think about those two coexisting coming together? Well, I think that, first of all, we have to stop thinking of labor as a commodity. Um, uh, matter of fact, one of the 10 Mondragon principles states very clearly that labor is a valuable resource, and finance, while important, is always secondary to labor. So we've Americanized that and put it on t-shirts, which you can order from our, our website at oneworkeronevote.org. I'm just imitating you, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> which says, own your labor, rent your capital. So how do we survive? Well, first of all, uh, we, have, we, we participate in the capitalist world. People, people often think that cooperatives are some form of kumbaya type of economic activity um, that you know, manages to eke out a profit. They're very capitalist organizations. Uh, Mondragon is a big believer in profitable enterprises. We don't even begin an economic development discussion unless the people involved, the stakeholders, are committed to a profitable enterprise um, and, and you know, profits are a way to freedom because after you've earned your profits, then you get to vote on how to align your values with the profits you've earned, and that becomes an incredible moment of liberation. You know, one of the things I would like to add, I think we don't give justice to the fact that people are really looking to find a way to come across uh, sectors, to talk to each other across sectors. When I look at the Emerald City's board, for example, or any of our local councils in any of our cities. We've got Youth Build, we have the Conservation Corps, we've got the energy service companies, the Johnson Controls and the Siemens, the Building Owner Managers Association, the Policy Link of the World. You know, we have the advocates, we've got the workforce players, we've got the energy companies. Some of them, I mean, and, and it's like, they keep coming back to these meetings. And I'm like, well, what are we giving away? We're not giving away anything other than ideas, an opportunity to talk outside of their lane, uh, a level of trust that's been built over a period of time, a sense that, uh, that there is some transparency and honesty where people can come in and say, I'm the only card carrying Republican in here. And then we have the armchair socialist saying, yeah, yeah, but we don't want you to leave. Um, people are looking for that table to have a conversation to do, to, to do things differently and in a better way. Right. Um, well. This book is all about that collaborative. Shameless, absolutely it is, it is, it is shameless. shameless. <laughs> uh, 
And I want to get back to this question more broadly later on about polarization in the country and then how these local examples can actually be scaled up. But can you share with us what, uh, we've kind of talked about this in some general terms. Can you concretely share with us, I'm gonna ask you too, uh, a success where you feel like, you know, in this particular city, the pieces came together and we really have at least started to begin to deliver? Um, well, let's just take uh, Seattle as, as one example. Um, no, San Francisco. There's so many good examples I can give. Let me just start with San Francisco because this is a, a very difficult environment. The city had a, a 50 percent local hire requirements that the uh, local building construction trade really balked at. They were very concerned about whether they, their guys that were on the bench were going to be able to uh, be able to deliver on that 50 percent local hire. Our community partners were at the table with the building trades and with the city of San Francisco uh, and fighting it out. I mean, it was a brutal battle. It was a, a bit of a bloodletting. I remember being in the airport in Atlanta and everybody saying the, the community workforce agreement is falling apart. The, it was an issue of quantity versus quality. And the, the community group wanted, you know, uh, 100 jobs and the building trades, well, you can get jobs, but there won't be careers. And so they had to negotiate and navigate. And to this day, they struck the deal and now they continue to be work, to, to use that community workforce agreements for additional projects and this level of engagement and trust that is now growing exponentially. Oh, that's great. It's set a template for change. Uh, when you think about this, Jay, and you think, either an individual or a program uh, where you say, my gosh, we really hit it with that. Sure. I mean, look, I, I think about it from the individual. Our work begins and ends with the young adult. So I'll tell you a story that uh, this gentleman shared on 60 Minutes, so I'm not saying anything that he hasn't said to millions of people. Um, there's a gentleman named Jay Hammonds who went through our program. And um, he graduated from high school. He was adopted by his Aunt Rose, not really his aunt, but someone in the neighborhood who adopted seven children in the neighborhood. And he went through high school, an incredibly talented young man, um, and couldn't afford to go to college. Like so many of, of our uh, young people in our country, financially it wasn't a viable option for him. And so he went to apply for a job at Safeway several times to be a checker at Safeway. And as we were talking about before, all work has value and dignity. So I, I mean, take that with that frame that I offer. Um, but he applied three different times, never got a call back uh, to even interview for that job. He was referred to our program, did a phenomenal job, interned at Facebook, uh, did a great job there and got hired at Facebook. Fast forward a couple of years, he does the, the support for Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg. And I think about what that means for Jay and his family, and I think that's probably pretty clear what that looks like for him. But I think about what that does for the economy, is that he was stuck potentially in a job that he had more potential for, and that just blocks other people in our economy. We can't afford that. So how is it that we deploy and have people uh, in the jobs that they are equipped to go do with the proper access and the proper training? And I also think it's good for the economy. And, and Facebook, I'm not saying anything they haven't said publicly as well, is they've never made a hiring plan, not because they lack the resources, but they lack the talent to hire people in the volume at the pace that they require. So I look at the, that as a win-win-win for him, uh, in his family, for what that means for the labor market, but then allowing companies to grow at the pace that they need to grow. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions in just a second. I'm going to start, uh, though, before that. Michael, you got a chance to talk a lot about success. Uh, what's the biggest challenge trying to roll this out, right. uh, particularly in the United States? I really appreciate you asking me that question because there are many challenges, um, but two big ones. One is, uh, Everyone is hung up on yesterday's vocabulary and fighting yesterday's war. So uh, there are people who really don't believe in their bureaucratic soul that workers can become owners or should be because they are vested in the struggle and they don't understand what the win-win could possibly be. And the second thing is that because our economic development uh, efforts as a nation are so sporadic and they're so, you know, savior on horseback oriented. We think in terms of one-offs and we don't think in terms of ecosystems. And unless you think in terms of ecosystems from the very beginning, your one-offs are never going to be sustainable. So we go into neighborhoods that call us um, and as an economic development swarm and we focus on, first of all, inclusivity to the max and then on the ecosystem. 
because our goal is to co-design, co-build, co-replicate, and co-scale. And unless we do that, you know, we will not make the impact that we have to make. Hi, Rick Aubrey from Tulane University. Uh, I've got a million questions, I'll, but I'll ask the first one of uh, Mondragon. Are you finding something different about the American sensibility or mentality that's either uh, uh, an opportunity or a challenge for creating these kind of cooperative arrangements? Well, I mean, in America, we tend to oscillate between, I built it all myself and it takes a village. And so the good thing about the labor movement is that the labor movement uh, has an ethos of solidarity. And solidarity, the solidarity economy is really what makes Mondragon so exceptional. Uh, and if you look at the, if you follow the Gini coefficients, which measure inequality, uh, the, there's three provinces in the Basque region, the middle one, Guithputhqua, it took me 10 years to learn how to say that. Um, uh, they have the lowest Gini coefficient of anywhere in the world. So, you know, when, when we talk about, uh, we have to lead by example, and we have to create tires so that other people can kick them, which is why we're so focused on creating these prototypes. The foundations now, we've, we've been self, we self-funded this since we started. The foundations are beginning to call. Um, that's interesting, um, necessary but not sufficient. Uh, and they always have the same questions, which is, well, you know, do you, do you, are you going to let a thousand flowers bloom? Because we don't think that's a good idea. Um, you know, we go to where people ask us to go. Right now, we cannot keep up with the demand. So we feel that there is a huge potential to do parts of the Mondragon experience, customize it, localize it, but make sure the people that are doing this own it from the beginning. It's theirs from the beginning. We're not there you know, to bring the tablets from the top of the mountain. So with the attack on unions continuing in the United States, how do we create solidarity while also selling, differentiating the Madrigon model and also collaborating across sectors and bringing this together? Wow, yeah. so Michael and then Denise. All right, you know, I would just like to say that the last time I was here in LA, it was to be part of a group that gave an award to Denise. Because I was on the board of the Apollo Alliance and we gave you an award for being such an incredible person. So I just wanted to say that. Um, so there is a concerted attack against the solidarity of working class people. I mean, in the land of the 1% and the 99%, why wouldn't you do that? In the land where there is unparalleled absentee ownership, why wouldn't you want to take out the last organizing force for working class people. Like Denise said, you know, unions have to change. They have to get over their building and trade racism, which kept communities of color out of the solution set. But not all unions are the same. SEIU, Steelworkers, uh, there's a lot of very progressive unions that are knocking down the doors, that are organizing alternative labor committees, the Fight for 15. A lot of things that we're seeing happening show that the millennials and the, and the generation wires, they want solidarity. They understand that unless they turn the sharing economy around, they'll spend their lives being involuntarily shared. So, so I, I see this happening all over the country, in all the different cities that we're in, uh, people are, are reaching out to the unions, not, not as the entire answer, but, but as part of the answer. And labor itself has to grow to the, to the level of the conversation. And I will tell you that they are. It's taken a long time, you know, because you're never a prophet in your own country. But I can tell you that in the AFL-CIO right now, uh, there's going to be a huge meeting on union co-ops in the near future. Uh, and they're going you know, to come to grips with this model because that horse has already left the barn. Yeah, and, and I would just add that, um, that we are, w labor and community partnerships is, is the, the only way forward. And the, the, the thing that communities of color have to get over is, is the history, is the past. Yep. And we've got to recognize that there's a new future. The new future is that there is an urging, uh, there's an aging uh, workforce. And in fact, unions are, uh, particularly the building trades, are recognizing that if they want their pensions paid right. for, they're going to have to recognize there's a new demographic out right. here. They're going to have to open up the door. So there's a right. willingness 
now in a way that there's never been before. And there's some locals that are, are better than others, but it's only through that partnership that we can advance um, our place in this union future, this, this, this middle, uh, middle income future. But I also, um, you know, I, I still think it's still going to be a challenge because we, we bought the narrative that the unions are not good for, for us. Uh, but we've got to build that partnership going forward. And I would just add, to say, there's a saying that we use all the time. We didn't invent it, of course. It came from Scotland. <laughs> um, but it says, nothing about us without us is for us. And, and the only thing I would add to is that the, the importance of unions is not just the economic power, but the political power that comes with this. And that's why it's be, become increasingly a uh, challenge to actually uh, ask for union dues, because they recognize that the worker voice and the worker's right to influence the financial influence of the political process is the only thing in the way of you know, the, the people with capital owning this country. And so worker voices are critical to whether or not we're going to have a democratic society. And a lot of union people, we're never going to get you in there, a lot of union people <laughs> want to know, you know, they don't understand the ownership um, position. They don't say, well, if you have a collective bargaining agreement, you know, and you're an owner, why, why do you need a collective bargaining agreement if you have an owner? And, and we say that if you look at a worker owner, the worker part of that worker owner, he or she, wants to have the highest possible wage that he or she can negotiate. And the owner part of the worker owner wants to have the most sustainable enterprise. And the individual micro, uh, the individual micro you know, trial and tribulation of solving that formula is called um, career liberation. Uh, great. Well, two uh, comments. I think we're seeing some models of how to have challenging conversations about difficult issues. Uh, and then the second comment is, is, if you've only been one place, Michael, where Denise is getting an award, you need to travel more. So uh, <laughs> I believe that's that, a good one. I believe that we had a hand I'm up over there. Put that on there. my T-shirt. Quick question on uh, how to keep people engaged. There's how do you balance the need for jobs today, and then the, to fill that skill training gap and the time it takes to train those individuals and keep them engaged to stick with the programs. Jay, would you mind tackling that? Yeah. Sure. I mean, you know, I think that um, if I think about some of the systemic problems that exist is that we ask an awful lot of young people in our country to delay gratification and to think about the long term horizon when they're struggling to figure out where they're going to lay their head down to rest or how they're going to feed their family. Um, and I think what we have to be doing more as a society and hopefully we do somewhat at year up is try to shrink that time horizon that there is a narrative that people hear, they understand the words, but they don't see the examples of that. And I can say that because I grew up on the other side of the opportunity divide. I grew up in public housing. I didn't have anyone who worked at a Salesforce or a Twitter or sale, you know, I didn't understand what that looked like. And so what we have to do is we have to make education relevant and rigorous so that people understand what it is they're going to school for. I can't tell you how many times a young person will come to our program and we'll, they'll talk about their high school experience and like, I don't know why I was there. I was supposed to go there. I went to, I went to community college because that's what I was supposed to do. But it just doesn't work until all of a sudden you understand there is a path that's real that I can access within a short period of time. And then people's motivation goes through the roof. And that's what's inspiring to watch. And so I think that it's not that hard to engage people and to get people to invest in themselves if there is a real path that is accessible in a short period of time. And that's the promise that we have to deliver on as a society. Yeah, and if, if I could also mention that the work of uh, Veronica. Veronica, are you in this room somewhere? Raise your hand. OK, Veronica runs an amazing program here called um, ACES, which is really youth. And we talked about the importance of youth and how you build this pipeline early on. And this is taking uh, junior and senior high school students giving them experiential learning opportunities and community college credits at the same time to see that there are career and, and college pathways that they can pursue in architecture, engineering, and construction in this particular instance. And the, the idea of being able to put them in a place where they can actually work, where they're working with architects and seeing how that you know, comes to life for them or, or how what an engineer does and working on a community college district project is what animates you know, education for them. You know, I've had two, two uh, African-American kids that went through public schools in LA, and they had two different experiences, one still in and out of prison, and the other who is literally a rocket scientist. And the difference is one had 
uh, experiential learning. And, and that's where it's particularly young boys and men of color really need to put their hands on stuff. They need to build things. They need to you know, not just sit down and, and write and do arithmetic. That's what we need to do for our young people so that they're not disengaged from school and can get the pathways for a better future. Hi, I'm Danielle Williams. I'm a doctoral student here at Price School. And I just wanted to follow up on that question, particularly asking you, Ms. Fairchild. Um, sort of, you know, we talked about asking the community, getting the answer in the streets, Michael mentioned. What do you do as, specifically with your work? And I know you work more in cities. I'm from Kentucky. I grew up in a place where if you called somebody anti-coal, that was fighting words. When you have communities that their answer is we need more of these jobs that aren't, that are just reinforcing the problem. Have you had experiences working with that and what have you guys taken the steps for? And also, I mean, this is for everybody really, what have you guys done to sort of deal with that when the community's answer might be, oh, we need more of what we have? Yeah. So, you know, it, is, it, it really comes out of the communities. Kentuckians for the Commonwealth is an example of a community coalition of coal, uh, of people that grew up in the coal industry that is aggressively moving to get Kentucky out of coal. Um, and some of, some of the evidence is, is very clear. I mean, these are the most dangerous jobs. It has the greatest negative health impacts in these communities. Um, but you do have to show them not only you know, what the problems are the, the sector, but where are the opportunities. And that's where we are challenged, to be perfectly honest. I mean, we are not generating enough uh, jobs in the renewable sector or the energy efficiency sector to offset you know, where we are in coal. But let me just say this about coal. Coal has been declining for at least 10 years. And, so, and, and the utility sector is very clear that uh, in three to five years, they're going to have to shut down and change their facilities because it's become obsolete. And now renewables are cheaper than coal. So the market in itself is not going to support coal going forward. And I think people are recognizing that we have to, what, what many frontline communities are talking about is a just transition. How do we develop, how do we move ourselves out of old fossil fuel economy and make sure that people that have been in those jobs have uh, alternative futures going forward. So we're very aggressive about a just transition. So Kentucky uh, for the Commonwealth is a really good platform. I'm gonna ask two last questions for the entire panel. Uh, just take a minute if you can. I know I'm asking big questions. <laughs> Kentucky's for the Commonwealth uh, with their, you know, basically the state legislature's, ref state government's refusing to do a clean power plan. So they're organizing a community-driven process to do their own clean power plan. Uh, they're trying to overcome the polarization. How do we work to overcome the polarization that's infected our politics and make so many of these obvious solutions, experimenting with co-ops, uh, connecting people to employment, seeing how we can bring business, labor, community together? How do we overcome the polarization? So I think, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words and a, a parable is worth a thousand pictures. Um, so Fleck Rivera, a young uh, illegal immigrant from Peru came to Cincinnati. Uh, he um, helped uh, work with immigrants to you know, give them a softer landing. He eventually finished his high school diploma, got his bachelor's degree, and then his MBA uh, from the University of Cincinnati. Um, he was the co-founder of the Cincinnati Union Cooperative Initiative, which is the living lab uh, prototype for the One Worker, One Vote movement. And he is the CEO of a, and the founder of a startup called Sustainergy. Sustainergy is an energy efficiency union co-op that reduces the carbon footprint in, in areas like over the Rhine, which is one of the less desirable areas of Cincinnati. Um, through Flecker's er efforts, he attracted the attention of a new utility aggregator called Empower Gas and Electric. Empower Gas and Electric has won contracts uh, in Cleveland, in Cincinnati, in Columbus, and Athens, Ohio. They now have about 500,000 households uh, that they supply energy to, and they are partnering uh, with Flecker and Sustainergy to deliver those energy efficiency services in those cities. And now the AFL-CIO is considering uh, making Sustainergy Union Co-op a national model and prototyping it across the country. So the best way to answer your question are those kinds of things. Jay. If I think about some of the most intractable problems we have as a country, they are going to require multi-sector solutions and approaches. 
And I think that into your question earlier about how many people have spent time in multiple sectors, I really feel like there are precious few people who have spent time in all the different sectors and are willing to engage and are willing to drive conversations across the sectors. Um, and I, you know, it's into Denise's point is that I, I think there's a real desire for that to occur. The problem is people don't understand each other's vocabulary. Yeah. There's not a clear understanding of motivations. Right. I mean, there, so when, when you sit down with someone from the private sector, there is a bottom line orientation. There is a different cycle and a pace of, of movement that is different than the public sector having spent time in the public sector. And so how is it we demystify the work that we all do in the different sectors? How do we establish our common goals? How do we establish a common vocabulary? How do we understand each other's motivations so that we can find that common ground and then understand we have some differences and how do we navigate those? And I would love to see us invest in a sector of multi-sector athletes that are there to weave together and to bring together um, the different uh, pieces of work and the threads of work to make a stronger rope. Denise, for you. And the only thing I, I would say is that the Emerald City's model happened when the economy tanked in 2009 and everybody was in a bad place. And so it really forced everybody to come together to figure out how we lock arms and move forward together. I don't, wouldn't suggest that that's the, the way to do it, but I think the disruptive idea here is that um, we all think the market is working, but the market is not working for anyone. Um, and if we begin to recognize that and begin to right. transform yeah. not markets and recognize that we are all in the same boat, then I think we can start rowing together. Yeah, yeah you know, it's interesting because I remember when I first got invited, I thought that the title, Activating Markets for Social Change, might need to be changed right. to Transforming Markets right. to That's Achieve right. Social Change. Right. So I'm going to ask the last question, and you get 30 seconds to answer. Uh, what gives you hope these days? Looking out at your work, at work that others are doing, what gives you hope? We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people from all of America, all walks of life, who now believe in gusher up instead of trickle down. <laughs> Jay, what gives you hope? Uh, the hope is looking at the young adults who graduate from our program, who have careers, who are buying houses, who are having children and, and supporting their families, and realizing that when given an opportunity, they rise to the occasion. The young people, um, everybody, <laughs> 25, 35 year old that are really have a intersectional framework for understanding uh, poverty and pollution and social uh, and economic and environmental justice. They've got the frame right. We just have to, uh, and they're, they're, on the sh they're in the streets, they're in City Hall, um, they're making a difference. And uh, I'll just add uh, that probably what gives me hope is what gives me pause, is that this country is at a breaking point. Uh, this level of inequality, we can't tolerate it. Tossing so many talented people from having a future in the labor market. It's uh, unproductive what we need to do in the future. Having such a crisis of over-incarceration and illegality for hardworking immigrants, uh, having a planet at risk, we can't tolerate the situation we're in. And I'm beginning to see bubble up on the one side, a desperate return, hope to return to something we can never return to, but on the other side, a new world waiting to be born. Thank you all for the work you're doing to help that new world come into being. You know, I never thought I'd have to ask my colleague Manuel to speak up. He was like holding back. I have a new idea for the name of the conference. He held it with him how many months? And then now he has unleashed it on us all, and I, and I love it. So, but next time, do speak up, Manuel. Don't, don't hold your tongue. Um, I think what we've seen today is just, you know, a start of a, a set of conversations. One, one, you know, one of the things we're going to do, of course, is, is we're going to uh, archive the conference. There's no way that all the things that I've heard today and learned today I'm going to process just by sitting at a table. Um, that you can return to it and continue the conversation as we go forward. You know, I was inspired by many different things today and, and starting with Michael's charge early this, earlier this morning about you know, understanding that we had exclusionary practices both in our public policies and in our private practices that have led us to this point and that we need to reject narratives around why we are where we are and why we can't get to where we want to be. 
Um, we also were challenged with thinking about population level accountability for results. And when you see all the social innovations that were discussed here today, you've seen how that they did alter people's thinking and altered people's practices and so forth. And